Okay, so what, what I want to do today, uh, most of you are not botanists, is just to give you uh, an overview of, of plant diversity patterns in Angola and finish up with some of the really peculiar environments and life forms that we've been encountering in the Quito system. But I want to put them into some wider context. As soon as you mention Angola to botanists, um, the first thing that everybody thinks of is Welwitchia. And everyone knows that this is a desert plant, and they usually think that it was collected originally in Namibia, as the Namibians have now hijacked it for their um, biotourism. But actually, it was first collected in southwest Angola. Um, it also illustrates Q's long history of involvement in Angola, and our second director, Joseph Hooker, actually described the genus in 1862, and then the species itself in, a, in quite a, a groundbreaking monographic treatment the following year. And well, which we'd, we've heard about already um, was a key figure in this. The illustration at the bottom is in our archives uh, in, the, in the library and art collections at Kew. That's Thomas Baines, who encountered the plant in Namibia. And we have um, preparatory field sketches, watercolours, and original oil paintings in, at Kew. And the flora of the western part of Angola is dry. As, as you drive up the coast, this is, this is taken um, once we've dropped off the Lubango escarpment and are heading up towards um, Bangela. Um, you've got a mosaic of um, African baobab, Mapani. A bit further north, it's, it's, um, you, you've got um, tree aloes and succulent euphorbias. So cer certainly the western part of Angola is, is, uh, is dry. But the first place I went um, with, with Brian's trip to uh, Kurumbo up in the northeast is very different. And this is, um, this is swamp forest. It's pure Congolian rainforest. So the idea that Angola is all dry is, is really not very accurate. <clears throat> if we go back to the, the base of, of knowledge, Brian's already touched on this a little bit. The earliest collections were actually um, 1694 by British naval surgeons. And these are now housed in uh, Sloan's herbarium which was the founder collection of both the British Museum and then subsequently the Natural History Museum in London. So I, I recently uh, made an appointment to see these. There's 250 volumes, bound volumes of herbarium specimens from all over the globe, from Sloan's network of collectors. And one of the people that he was working with was um, James Pettiver, who was um, <coughs> a physician and a, a, an apothecary in London who had his own network of collectors. So these were collected um, from the Luanda er area, probably by naval surgeons on slave ships in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And just a couple of the less scrappy specimens for illustration purposes. The one on the right is um, mandioca, the money hot, um, uh, a new world crop. So evidence of early introductions of, of New World food plants in, into Africa. But the three big collectors that we tend to think about are Wellwich, an Austrian botanist in Angola for six years. Um, first of all, collected along the coast. Then he had a, quite a, a major expedition into the interior from Luanda and a later expedition up, into the, up onto the Huila Plateau. He didn't get into our core area, but um, there's lots of early collections. Um, as Brian said, 8,000 collections, 5,000 species, 1,000 new species to science. 
But there's a theme with these collectors. Their localities are impossible to localise or very largely. Uh, we've been working with Francisco to try and pin down some of those localities on the uh, Huila Plateau, but there's a long way to go. John Gosweiler, um, actually recruited while he was at Kew, um, but spent 50 years um, documenting plant diversity in Angola. And he's the person who's collected most widely across the whole country. Again, real difficulties in trying to pin down some of the precise localities. And on the, <coughs> um, on the, the 2011 trip to London Orsi, up in the northeast of the country, um, after a lot of questioning, we managed to pin down the park in Dundo, where there's a statue of, of Gosweiler. More relevant to the Quito expedition uh, and, and program, uh, Hugo Baum was on a German expedition, the Kuneni Zambezi expedition, 1899-1900, that went in from the coast um, right in the south, got up onto the plateau um, just south of Lubango, and then headed east. And a lot of our collecting localities um, on the Longa River and um, uh, Quito tributaries, the earliest collections come from this expedition. And so actually a lot of our subsequent field work in the um, source area has extended known distributions um, way to the north. <clears throat> we use this as a sort of baseline for, for reference purposes. Relatively recent, only 10 years old, check checklist coordinated by Estrella Figueredo and Gideon Smith. Um, there were about 30 contributors of different plant groups. Um, eight of my colleagues at Kew, myself included, contributed to this. So we've now got a, a baseline list of plants positively re recorded from Angola. But from what sort of data, um, it's rather questionable. Uh, and so you'll see a few familiar images popping up again, time and again. This is GBIF data filtered for plants a couple of years ago at the start of this project. And we haven't got very far into filling that data gap. Um, the three provinces on the east side of Angola, uh, the Lundas up in the north, Moshika, the largest province in the country in the center, and um, Kwanda Kubango in the southeast, they're largely devoid of, of botanical baseline data. <coughs> Something nasty has happened to my, my map. Um, <laughs> Um, this, is a, this is a map of, of Angola, <laughs> and it's, it's really sort of just highlighting some of the um, expeditions that I've been involved in, which are these, these black um, stars, and, and the yellow stars are other expeditions where colleagues of mine have been involved. So the north... Uh, uh, the top star is Cabinda, and my boss, Martin Cheek, who's more interested in, in wet forest Africa, has, has had um, a, a small uh, trip up there. The southwest is Brian's uh, Iona and Huila Expedition 2009, and we, we managed to get one of my colleagues, Francis uh, Crawford, who's now the curator of the herbarium in Windhoek. Um, onto that expedition, and while Ian and I were up in Corumbo, up in the northeast in 2013, uh, we managed to get another um, junior colleague to join an Ocacom expedition to the southeast, to the minefields of Kwanda So I'm just going to give you a little snapshot of some of the um, the major sort of vegetations and, and sort of areas of interest um, for the escarpment, for Carumbo, and then finishing off with, with the Quito headwaters. <coughs> this is uh, the landscape in general in London Orsi, 
top right hand corner of Angola, also deeply overlain with Kalahari sands, but it's actually it's a fundamentally different system compared to the Quito system. So some of the comparisons are quite interesting. Um, the grasslands, which um, we've already said are, are where the interesting plants are in, in Quito, um, in the Lunda grasslands, they're on the plateau. And so you have Zambezi and savannas, as far as the eye can see, on the tops of, of, of the Kalahari sand deposits. It's even higher rainfall than the Quito system, but it's lower altitude. And where the rivers have cut down to the base of the deposits, 150 meters down, you've got fingers of pure Congo rainforest, swamp forest, um, very difficult to, to get around in. As soon as you step off the path, you're up to your waist or, or higher in, in water. Um, but actually, the interesting plants tend to be in the savanna system, and you get some local cross-border endemism between the northeast of Angola and the Kasai region. The species composition of the Congo rainforests is that it's the really widespread species that are all through the basin. And this is what we pull together at the end of two um, trips, um, three to four weeks total in the field. We tripled the number of known plants from the province we ended up with a checklist of over 750 taxa um, using Figueredo and Smith as a baseline, 72 new records for Angola, even more if you ignore Cabinda, and potentially 22 new species. And just to reinforce that it's the grasslands that um, are throwing up the interesting things, this uh, this legume is very obscure. Um, we hadn't got any collections of it at Kew. There's only two or three known collections anywhere. Um, we managed to get um, DNA of this um, to contribute to a, a project which is trying to place this, this weird monotypic genus. And we only encountered that once. <coughs> Moving west, the, the western side of Angola is not deeply overlain with Kalahari sands. It's got much richer substrates, really spectacular environment, and totally different uh, botany. The, the Labango escarpment is the most uh, spectacular part of this. Um, and I reckon that there's maybe 150 species of plant endemic just to this area. But I never quite get the time to write that up. But the, because Lubango is, is a major city and it's just down the road, um, the only woody vegetation that's left here is in the inaccessible forest, uh, forested gullies. So with Francisco, we've been exploring um, some areas a bit further north which have a much more intact mosaic of, in, of, of vegetation which may hopefully inform what's going on in, in the Lubango area. And Mount Namba has quite extensive areas of Afro-Montane forest, rocky grassland, and then Miombo woodland on the slopes. There's Francisco in action. And one of the new species of, of Acanthaceae that my colleague um, Ian Darbush is describing. Also in the same general area, this is Kwanzaa Sul, um, Kumbira forest, this is lower altitude, it's under the escarpment, and it's where the cloud comes in off, off the ocean and directly under the cloud at night, you, uh, where the cloud settles, um, you've got well-developed uh, Congolian forest. Again, not terribly species diverse, but it, this is one of the most southerly um, patches of, of this kind of vegetation in Angola. And it's an important bird area. And we were, were there with some ornithological colleagues who were really interested in it. And they had been writing up their results, um, but they'd fundamentally misunderstood the canopy trees. So it's the importance of having botanists in the loop. We, we um, just published a very brief um, checklist uh, summary of what, what our findings were. But to get to the core um, subjects of this meeting, 
This is um, a map you've already seen of data points from the cumulative um, Quito expeditions. And you can see from, <coughs> um, uh, from this Google Earth image, um, this headwater area is really the, um, the furrowed zone is the zone that's of interest to us. You've got a different flora to the west with the, the substrate more um, in evidence, and you've got a different flora to the south in the more arid zones. And again, the landscape, it's homing in. It's monotonous, um, high rainfall, moist miombo woodland with a largely Zambesian makeup, but with some Guinea or Congolian elements. And the interesting parts are those fingers, narrow fingers of um, of grassland. <laughs> and just to move through, each site is subtly different. Those are the two headwater lakes. You have to keep moving and finding um, different uh, plants in the different zones. We were also interested in how people are, are interacting with the landscape, and so there's a couple of examples of, of fish traps, uh, bark canoes, um, beehives. Um, my excess luggage two years in a row has been bulky beehives and this one's now on display in one of the public galleries at Kew. But in the course of this work we started um, looking at, at the headwater lakes. Um, the aquatics aren't terribly diverse in, in this area, it's a very low nutrient system, but what was unusual was, was the deposits of peat and so this started the thinking that's, that's, that, that's got our palynological team involved, which we'll hear results of uh, shortly. There are one or two interesting um, aquatics. This is Genelisia angolensis, recorded 300 kilometers to the north of the previous. But as I say, coming back to the grasslands, this is where the interesting species are. And one of my own specialist uh, interests in, in the milkweed family, the Apocinaceae. This is a very isolated lineage, five species. There's actually a sixth undescribed one. And it's interesting because those few species straddle the um, arid and the, um, and the more humid zones. So there's some evolution between biomes going on there. But ever since starting work, on Africa 30 years ago at Kew, I've been aware of, of this paper, Frank White's Underground Forests of Africa. And so I'm just going to finish off with a couple of slides that show you, yeah, can you, finish off? Yeah, yeah. Show you some of the peculiarities. But look at that circle. That is the heart of our project area, and it's this high rainfall Kalahari sand system. And the plant on the left is that that was its, its distribution. The phenomenon of underground forest is basically that in a group usually of Congolian origin of forest trees, in this environment you have one species behaving as a pyrophyte, and this never get, gets taller than that high off the ground. That's in the Meliaceae. The one to the right is in a different family. This shows the, the Miombo canopy two centimetres off the ground with uh, forest emergence, in this case a legume, an erythrina, in this case, and this really shocked some Southeast Asian colleagues of mine, that's in the Diptrocarpaceae, the Southeast Asian timber um, family. Some just wacky plants in the Rubiaceae. And this we only encountered once, so this underlines my argument that we have to get into those grasslands, as many of them as we can, at as many different seasons as we can. We only saw this once. This is the only species in the genus Baffia, a legume, um, 50 species in tropical Africa, mostly in the Zambezi, in, in the Congolian environment, two species in, on white sand in northwest Madagascar, and this one that behaves in this bizarre fashion. So that's just yeah, to, that's just to thank Halo Trust, and I'm finished. <laughs> thank you. So, so <laughs>